Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Aditya Prakash, and welcome to the uh, final uh, seminar of IDEA Seminars, AI Seminar Series of this semester. So I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Professor Jesse Taylor from MIT, who will be talking about uh, a collision course, Artificial Intelligence meets, meets Fundamental Interactions. So Jesse is the inaugural director of the NSF AI Institute for uh, Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. He's a theoretical particle physicist, uh, 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 and he joined the MIT Physics Department in 2010 and is currently an associate professor in the Center for Theoretical Physics. He was a fellow at the Miller Institute uh, at Berkeley, and then he got his physics, a PhD in physics from Harvard in 2006, and uh, a bachelor's uh, uh, in, in math and physics from Brown in 2002. He has been awarded many uh, awards throughout his career, an early career research award from DOE, a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientist Engineer, the PKS from White House, and a Sloan as well into 2013. Uh, so again, I'm, uh, let's welcome Jesse for uh, this talk. I'm really happy to welcome him to the series. Jesse, over Great. to you. Great, thanks, Edith. Thanks for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. So um, and, I am the- uh, and Sorry to interrupt, uh, Jesse. Just one, one thing I wanted to point out to the audience that as usual, we'll take questions uh, through the chat because Jesse won't be able to see you. So Jesse, I'll interrupt you if there are some questions which require urgent attention, otherwise I'll read it off at the end of the talk. Thanks, sorry. Okay, Go ahead. okay perfect. Uh, okay, so great. So um, I am the, uh, the the director of this new uh, Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. And uh, these two fields are ones that uh, are on a collision course. And I mean a collision course in kind of two ways. Uh, for this talk. One is telling you about this intersection of these two fields, um, but also I work in particle physics and we uh, work with particle colliders, and I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about what we do in particle collisions as an example of this intersection of these two fields. Um, so uh, first, uh, just to give you some uh, more information about this institute, so the NSF AI Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, uh, it has an unpronounceable acronyms, but we've been calling it IFI. And you can see this intersection between fields in our logo, which either looks like a capital A with a lowercase i on top of it, so that's for AI, or like a, a capital F and a capital I next to each other, so that's for fundamental interactions. Um, and we really do see uh, artificial intelligence and fundamental physics as being flip sides of the same coin. Uh, this NSF-funded uh, effort is uh, anchored at MIT with substantial involvement from Harvard, Northeastern, and Tufts. And uh, what we're trying to do with this institute is we're trying to advance physics knowledge from the smallest building blocks of nature to the largest structures in the universe and galvanize AI research innovation. So it's really making progress both on the physics side and on the AI side and uh, doing uh, great science along the way. So uh, there's many different components to this institute, which I'll be telling you a little bit about in this uh, talk today. Um, we have uh, efforts in theoretical physics, that's uh, my subdomain, uh, in experimental physics as well, as well as in the foundations of AI, and these are three fields that uh, don't necessarily talk to each other as much as they should. And so we're trying to build bridges between these fields via this AI Institute. And one of the ways that we're trying to do that is via a, a prize post postdoctoral fellowship program, our IFI fellows, which are kind of acting like the gluons within the uh, 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 pieces of the Institute. So on the left-hand side, this uh, kind of red, green, and blue blobs, uh, this is the way that uh, particle physicists represent a proton with the blobs uh, being kind of like the quarks of the Institute. And then the gluons are the glue that tie together the various elements and uh, bind us into a more complete whole. So there's many uh, aspects of our Institute. We have training, education, and outreach at the physics AI intersection. We're aiming to cultivate early career talent, um, basically people who would might be deciding between a career either in the physics or more on the computer science side. Uh, and this program allows uh, those folks to actually pursue both interests simultaneously. Uh, fostering connections to physics facilities and to industry. And then something that I'm most excited about is for us to build strong multidisciplinary collaborations and advocate for shared solutions across subfields. And in putting this institute together, um, it was remarkable to me how much uh, different uh, areas uh, actually uh, share common uh, goals. So for example, in particle physics, what I'm going to be talking about today, our goal is to analyze collision debris and there's uh, a number of senior investigators in our institute uh, focused on particle physics and understanding collision debris. Uh, but we also have people on the more foundational uh, AI side, in particular my colleague Justin Solomon, who works on geometric data processing. And uh, remarkably, uh, classifying furniture uh, into various categories and analyzing collision debris at colliders like the Large Hadron Collider, 
uh, these turn out to share many similarities. And already we've started to build shared solutions to our problems. I'm looking forward to uh, many more uh, over the five years of this institute. So let me give you a little bit more background uh, about uh, fundamental physics. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to try to start uh, as, basic as, I, as basic as I can. can. Um, so the uh, pillars of fundamental physics, on the largest scales, uh, we have Big Bang cosmology, which explains how the universe started in a hot, dense state and evolved primarily under the influence of gravity to the universe that we see today. Uh, Big Bang cosmology involves ingredients like dark matter, uh, dark energy, as well as radiation, uh, neutrinos, and a little bit of matter. And uh, this is one of the areas where there is exciting uh, uh, things going on in the physical sciences, trying to understand the origins of our universe uh, and uh, understand better this Big Bang cosmology and in particular what came before it. Uh, on the shortest distance scales of nature, we have the standard model of particle physics represented here in pie chart form. So in orange are the quarks of the standard model, in green are the leptons of the standard model, in blue are force carriers. Uh, these are the mediators of forces like the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the, uh, the weak force. And at the center of the standard model is the Higgs boson, discovered at the Large Hadron Collider at 2012, and one that's uh, still undergoing uh, intense scrutiny to understand its role in uh, the dynamics of uh, the universe at the shortest distance scales. So we have the longest distance scales in nature on the left, the shortest distance scales in nature on the right, and uh, I would say that understanding these two pillars uh, has been a real triumph of human intelligence. And our understanding of how much dynamics is actually explained by uh, the forces of gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, and the weak force is kind of remarkable. And we'd like to be able to translate uh, the lessons from uh, physical reasoning and translate them into uh, other contexts, uh, in particular into artificial intelligence contexts. Um, and hopefully you'll get a chance uh, in this talk to see an example of that at work. How is it that if you take physics concepts seriously, you can actually build uh, new artificial intelligence uh, uh, systems uh, that are more powerful than uh, methods that didn't account for those physical principles? So the um, uh, just one thing to point out in the slide, um, my, my research focus is on the strong force. Uh, the strong force is not necessarily something that everyone in this audience has, has heard about, so I'll, I'll be telling you a little bit more about the strong force uh, in explaining my research, um, but I'm happy to tell you more in Q&A about uh, any of the things that are happening in our institute uh, re revolving uh, any of the forces of nature as well as cosmology and the standard model. Okay, so I'm titling my, my talk Collision Course, and this is a, a title that I started to use in January of 2019 there was a workshop at the Aspen Center for Physics on theoretical physics for machine learning. And uh, what I started to realize around then uh, was that uh, there really was a collision uh, between two fields that we could exploit. So before I tell you about that, uh, let me explain this picture of what you're seeing right now. So here you're seeing uh, an image taken from uh, collisions of two protons at the Large Hadron Collider. Those protons are brought into collision. Something happens um, that could be dynamics within the standard model of particle physics, or it could be dynamics that actually points to some new physics. And from that collision, we get these sprays of radiation uh, coming out. And somehow we have to figure out from these sprays of radiation uh, what's going on at short distances in nature. And just to give you a sense of the scope of the problem, um, every 25 nanoseconds, uh, there is a new proton-proton collision that happens. And that's an enormous data volume that one has to sift through. In fact, it's such a large data volume that you're not even able to store um, uh, all of these images uh, to tape. You have to make selection criteria to decide which images are, are interesting to keep and which ones to throw away. Um, and then for each individual event uh, that you want to study, there are various data analysis strategies that one can pursue. And so the simplest one that you can see just by eye is that you have these clusters of, uh, of, of radiation, clusters of particles coming from the central collision point. Um, and these clusters are what we call jets. And jets are both a physical phenomena. It basically tells you what happens when you make quarks and gluons in the standard model at short distances, what those quarks and gluons manifest themselves at long distances. Um, but jets in a machine learning language uh, is an example of an unsupervised uh, uh, clustering strategy uh, where basically given uh, a collection of points, you wanna find how to arrange those points into the uh, best collimated sprays that you can that uh, is your best proxy for the underlying dynamics of the system to study. 
So I'm going to be telling you in this in in this uh, in this talk uh, a little bit more about collider physics. So hopefully uh, from this talk you'll you'll know more about collider physics than you do when you came in. Um, but the second meaning of collision course, uh, which is uh, in the title, uh, is the collision between the physical sciences and mathematics, statistics, and computer science. Um, and this was on on display at this Aspen workshop that I mentioned, where people who came from a physics science background um, had interesting ways of thinking about the mathematics between behind artificial intelligence. And people coming from a mathematics, statistics, and computer science background had an enormous range of tools that they could use to analyze uh, physical data. And so part of the institute is is figuring out how can we gain new insights into fundamental physics facilitated by advances in artificial intelligence. And of course, vice versa, can we uh, gain new insights into artificial intelligence facilitated by advances in the fundamental in fundamental physics? And I put asterisks here because, you know, of course, it's not just fundamental physics. There's many scientific domains which are benefiting from artificial intelligence. And then I put an asterisk next to artificial intelligence because that's, in my mind, a broad umbrella to talk about all sorts of interesting things happening in computer science, in statistics, in data science. And we want to capitalize on all of those advances, um, of which you know, AI is one component. Uh, of course, the component that's in the title of our, of our institute. So broadly speaking, if you want to just say in kind of one line you know, what the goal of our, of our institute is uh, trying to do, you know, one way of saying what we're trying to do is, can we teach a machine to think like a physicist? And this is in contrast to other uh, strategies for uh, engaging with artificial intelligence. Uh, for example, trying to mimic the creativity that you might find in human intelligence and uh, trying to teach a machine to think like a toddler. Uh, so you know, I have uh, an eight-year-old son and trying to uh, reason with, uh, with the child is not the easiest thing to do. Uh, my son can't necessarily explain all of the logic that goes into decisions that, that he's making. What we'd like to do is we'd like to develop AI techniques that um, actually incorporate best practices from the physical sciences and uh, teach a machine how to do the same type of rigorous physical reasoning that we do as, uh, as domain experts. And, you know, when this question was kind of first posed to me, I, I said, no, no way, how can we possibly teach a machine to think like a physicist? And uh, in particular, the, the revolution that's been happening in deep learning didn't seem like uh, it, it corresponded to the way that physicists approached problems. But over time, I've come to realize uh, that actually uh, there is this convergence and uh, there is a way to infuse AI techniques with domain knowledge in a useful way, in particular, the domain knowledge of physics. And let me just give you an example to highlight how my own mind was changed by using an example not from physics, uh, but an example from image processing uh, that convinced me that teaching machine how to do something in an intelligent way I would actually give you better answers uh, to your problems than you would have gotten if you were not to uh, put that uh, human knowledge or domain knowledge uh, into the machine. And so the example um, here, it comes from image processing um, where uh, this is a, an in-painting task that you might be familiar with, where you're given a corrupted image on the left-hand side. In this case, this is an image of a, of a library and you have various regions that are masked out in white and you wanna go from that corrupted image and you want to uh, try to reconstruct, uh, based on your prior knowledge about how these images are made, uh, your best guess about what this library actually looked like underneath those masks. So the standard story that I had heard about deep learning and deep learning's ability to do this type of in-painting task is that one, we have increased computational power. And so you're able to um, just use that raw computational power to actually just do much better uh, kind of likelihood analyses, if you want to think about it that way, much better analyses than you could do with more limited computational resources. And then the other thing I had heard is that you need, you know, large data sets. So if you imagine having a billion pictures of a library, you know, if you've seen a billion libraries, then you've seen them all, and you can use that to build up a prior knowledge about what libraries in general look like, and then use that to find what is the closest library uh, 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 on the right-hand side uh, to the uh, corrupted one on the left-hand side, and that's your best guess about how to solve this in-painting task. And you know, using lots of computing power, using large data sets, of course, I'm familiar with that in particle physics where we do uh, benefit from increased computational power and gigantic data sets at the Large Hadron Collider. But you know, I'm a theoretical physicist, so a lot of the work that I do is pencil and paper and chalk and chalkboard, and I didn't see what kind of role that I could play in the deep learning revolution because it didn't seem to involve domain knowledge in any way. But this example from image processing uh, actually convinced me that you can fuse deep learning 
uh, with uh, what a theoretical physicist might call uh, deep thinking, where uh, you can make progress not just by increased computational power and large data sets, but also by understanding the structure of this problem. And in particular, what was so inspiring to me about this inpainting task is that this is a, a machine learning strategy that didn't ever see any example photographs. Um, it was a randomly initialized neural network. It had not been pre-trained, uh, having seen uh, any prior images. Rather, the way that this inference task was carried out uh, was by understanding the structure of the problem and realizing that when you have an image like a library, you have repeated patterns, you know, basically grid-like structures at different scales in the, uh, in the image, and you could figure out how to use a kind of convolutional neural network type structure, even if it was randomly initialized, to actually figure out how to do a kind of um, uh, a cut and paste task and uh, use the uh, information that is unmasked to figure out what's going on behind the mask, even though you've never seen uh, images of that type before. And so because of that, I became convinced that I could be using domain knowledge from, from my field and inject that domain knowledge into a machine learning architecture and be able to do uh, better on that task, even in cases where I didn't have uh, necessarily training data to, to work with. Okay, so that's a, an example from, uh, from image processing. Uh, let me now uh, use it as an example from my research and tell you about this intersection of artificial intelligence and fundamental interactions. And uh, uh, my research is in, on the short distance side, so uh, that involves uh, the standard model of particle physics. And I want to give you uh, an example of a research program that we've been doing that has been leveraging our knowledge about collider data in order to build new types of machine learning strategies uh, that incorporate that knowledge. So uh, here again is the standard model of particle physics. And uh, a number of these uh, names are, are unfamiliar to you, uh, though there are a few ones that you might have heard of before. So for example, the particles that experience electromagnetic interactions, uh, in particular photons, which carry uh, the electromagnetic force, as well as electrons, which should be very familiar to you, um, and the heavier cousin of the electron called the muon, these are elementary particles, uh, which means that if these are produced in the collision debris at the LHC when I slam together two protons, um, these are objects that I can reconstruct directly um, and actually see in my detector. But everything else in this pie chart is either unstable, that is you make it and then a split second later it disintegrates, um, or it gets bound up by um, uh, the strong force, which again is my research area, and so the quarks in orange and uh, the gluon, the G shown in blue, uh, quarks and gluons are ones that experience the strong force and we never see quarks and gluons uh, isolated in nature. Rather, quarks and gluons get bound up into composite states. The proton is one example of a composite state, uh, but there's other ones with, uh, with funny names, so pions, kaons, k-longs, protons, neutrons. These are composite states that actually can hit our detector um, and uh, we can use those composite states to infer that quarks and gluons were produced. But this is a relatively limited palette of things that we actually see in our detector. Everything else about this pie chart, for example, the Higgs boson or the W boson or the Z bosons, fundamental particles whose properties uh, we've inferred from collision debris, you don't actually see them directly in your collision debris, rather you only see them via their, uh, their remnants in terms of the elementary and composite states that are long enough lived to actually hit your detector and be visible. So if that wasn't hard enough as an inference task to measure this collection of final state particles and reconstruct the structure of the standard model, it's even more complicated because you have to have these particles run into various detectors. And the detectors that we use in particle colliders are very heterogeneous. They have very different types of, of outputs, actually outputting at different time scales. It's actually a quite challenging uh, data reconstruction problem. And um, what we have is we have uh, tracking detectors that see uh, some particles, uh, calorimeters, uh, two different types of calorimeters that see particles. Uh, we have a specialized system uh, dedicated to just detecting muons. And uh, what you end up getting uh, is these uh, collisions that look like this. Again, this is happening every 25 nanoseconds, you get a picture that looks like this. And somehow from these various uh, tracking and calorimetry information, somehow you have to reconstruct the individual particles that are hitting your detector. And then you want to do, as I mentioned, these kind of clustering strategies to find out which of those particles are related to each other uh, uh, to form these jet-like objects which act as proxies for uh, the fundamental quarks and gluons that you aren't able to see directly. So this is a, a very challenging data set to, uh, to deal with. 
On the other hand, um, the structure of this data set, if you think about it uh, in its most abstract form, is actually one that's quite familiar. Uh, once you've done this reconstruction task, then at the end of the day, the spray of particles that are coming out from the collision point can be described as just a collection of points in momentum space. Uh, the particles have momentum in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, and they're all coming from this one central collision point. So uh, I can just think about these as being points in momentum space, you know, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 points in momentum space for any individual uh, collider event. And that data structure, a collection of points in space, is one that's quite familiar to people who work in the machine learning or artificial intelligence worlds. Um, that's something that would be called a point cloud. Um, so typical point clouds that people talk about are collections of points in, uh, in position space and typically in three-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, and that's the kind of uh, data that you would get from, let's say, a self-driving car with LIDAR point detection, where you have a collection of points that are in position in X, Y, and Z uh, evolving in time. And it's maybe not so surprising that a number of the tasks that you'd like to do with a self-driving car have an analog in the collider physics realm. So for example, you might wanna solve a segmentation task where you wanna find a collection of points represented by these boxes uh, that are actually corresponding to individual objects. So uh, that's the direct analog of, on the particle physics side, identifying these jets, these collimated sprays of particles, uh, and uh, trying to understand uh, uh, you know, which clusters are kind of optimum uh, in terms of representing uh, distinct objects in your uh, collision event. In the case of these jets, uh, you'd like to classify them. Did that jet come from a quark? Did that jet come from a gluon? Did that jet come from a W boson, from a Higgs boson? Well, that classification task, of course, on the uh, self-driving car side is saying, are these objects, you know, is that a bicycle? Is that a car? Is that a pedestrian? Clearly that classification task is one that uh, you would like to get, uh, get correct. And uh, some of the same uh, goals in self-driving cars of having reliable inference uh, as well as fast inference, those are things that are also shared on the particle physics side when we're doing uh, collider studies. So you might think, oh, all I need to do is take all of the off-the-shelf uh, uh, point cloud uh, machine learning strategies and just use those for particle physics uh, uh, data analysis. And if that were the case, then there would be nothing fun for our Artificial Intelligence Institute to do. Um, but actually, we can use our domain knowledge, our knowledge about really what's going on in this particle collider to develop more robust AI technique. And that's what I'm gonna be telling you about using my own research as just an example of, of one case where you're just gonna be able to see this uh, very clearly in action. And so to, um, to do this, I need to tell you just a little bit more about uh, this process of jet formation. So this is again, what happens in the strong force when quarks and gluons bind together. So I start off with my proton-proton collision. Uh, as I mentioned already, protons are composite states. They're bound states of quarks and gluons. And when I slam them together at high energies, I liberate those quarks and gluons. Those quarks and gluons um, undergo a process called radiation. So just like electrons, when they move around, they generate uh, electromagnetic radiation. Quarks and gluons, when they move around, uh, they generate gluonic radiation. Um, and the, the key difference between the strong force and the electromagnetic force is that uh, in the strong force, uh, gluons can create more gluons. In the uh, electromagnetic case, unless you're dealing with something like nonlinear optics, photons don't actually generate more photons. Um, those quarks and gluons, we don't see them directly. Uh, they bind together, so eventually the strong force becomes strong. Uh, and uh, as I go out from the collision point, those quarks and gluons uh, bind together to form these composite states that we call hadrons. So the reason why the collider is called the Large Hadron Collider is because we're colliding together protons, and protons are examples of that composite hadron state. Those hadrons hit my detector. I just described how challenging it was to, to figure out what's going on uh, in your detector. Uh, and somehow we have to figure out, you know, our goal is to understand the dynamics of quarks and gluons, but we have to view it through this, uh, uh, you can think of it kind of like a, a smearing a generative process where the quarks and gluons get smeared out because they're bound into hadrons, the hadrons get smeared out because you have imperfect detection. But I can use my knowledge as a theoretical physicist to say, well, in this whole process uh, of going from quarks and gluons to composite hadrons to detection, what information about this collision is most robust? Uh, and in particular, what's most robust about this collision is the flow of energy off to infinity. So in a quantum mechanical language, there's a quantum mechanical operator called the energy flow operator. And for those of you with a physics background, um, you'll recognize this capital T uh, in this formula here is the stress energy tensor. 
uh, T0, uh, that, means the that means energy, and T0I, that means the flow of energy. The flow of energy from the central collision point going out to uh, an idealized theorist detector at infinity, that is information that's robust to these hadronization and detector effects, which are challenging to model. And so if we focus on energy flow, this is information that I think is most robust. And therefore, if I build an AI architecture uh, around that idea of capturing correctly the energy flow and not the full information about hadronization and detection, I will be able to make more robust inference, um, and in particular, robust inference that I can actually do uh, first principles theoretical calculations related to. So this is an example of this collision course, a collision between uh, the principles of fundamental physics, in this case, this robustness of energy flow, um, which uh, for those of you who, who uh, maybe know something about, about fundamental physics, uh, this energy flow concept, it comes from the field of quantum field theory, a quantum field theory is the uh, mathematical structure that underpins the standard model of particle physics. So this is, you know, a kind of bedrock principle of, of fundamental physics that this uh, energy flow is robust. But then you have from the other side, the power of artificial intelligence, and in particular, uh, the power of various point cloud learning strategies. And so what I'm gonna be presenting today is based on um, work that was developed at Carnegie Mellon, uh, uh, an architecture that's called deep sets. Uh, into this collision, you also need two fantastic graduate students. Uh, my uh, 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 current student, Patrick Amitsky, who's graduating uh, soon, and my former student, Eric Matodiev, who graduated this year. You also need funding uh, from various agencies, uh, of course, including the National Science Foundation, which has funded our, our new uh, uh, Artificial Intelligence Institute. And uh, out pops a new neural network uh, architecture uh, called Energy Flow Networks, which is a synthesis of this fundamental uh, physics uh, idea. Uh, uh, synthesized with uh, point cloud learning techniques from the literature. So uh, 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 what can I tell you about this energy flow network? So let me give you a little bit more technical detail just to have a little bit of, of, of meat in this talk today. Um, so on, on, a, on a technical side, the difference between what we're doing in, on generic point cloud learning techniques is that what we're doing is we're dealing with what are called weighted point clouds. So uh, each point has a weight associated with it and zero weight uh, uh, points don't uh, uh, carry any information. Um, and if you have two points that are going in the same direction, uh, then the uh, total of their weights is all that matters. The individual weights of those points, if they're on top of each other, uh, is, is irrelevant. So what that corresponds to in the particle physics language is that we have in energy weighted directions. So the momentum of particles, instead of talking about px, py, and pz, we talk about the direction nx, ny, and nz, and then the uh, energy serves as a weight. And uh, 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 an equivalent way of talking about this is imagine you put like a camera uh, uh, on your detector and you're kind of looking back down at the spray of particles coming from the central collision point and you wanna think about how much energy is being deposited. Uh, you can think about this uh, information as being an energy density. So you have energy at various different points, those points corresponding to points on your detector. And this energy density uh, uh, carries the same information as this weighted point cloud and we wanna develop a machine learning architecture that uh, uses this representation as the fundamental representation for understanding what's going on. So with this background, we can now think like a physicist. <laughs> so uh, apologies for the overly cartoon version of machine learning. So we have a black box, uh, you know, the machine. Of course, a huge amount of, of, uh, of research has gone into creating effective black boxes to solve a variety of tasks. Uh, we input a properly specified problem. In this case, I'm going to show you a jet classification task, trying to classify jets in terms of the two dominant categories that appear in particle physics, quark jets and gluon jets. That's the equivalent uh, in the image processing of like cat uh, pictures and dog pictures. Uh, so we have quark jets and gluon jets, and uh, that classification task is a properly specified problem we can do. We have many examples that we could use for uh, training. And uh, we can also inject into this architecture uh, two facts from physics. One fact from physics uh, comes from quantum mechanics, and that's the fact that uh, uh, there's a symmetry where identical particles are indistinguishable. That is, you can't tell if you're given two photons, you can't tell which one was first or which one was second. Uh, that means that you can't use natural language processing techniques where you take um, sentences which have an actual semantic ordering to them where the order matters. With particles, you can't do that. If you're given a collection of particles, the order in which you see them uh, carries no uh, information. Therefore, you need to have a permutation symmetry on your inputs if you wanna do the learning properly. Uh, 
this, uh, this energy flow concept or this energy weighting, uh, the technical name for this is safety or even more technical, infrared and collinear safety. That basically says uh, that you wanna make sure that your points are treated in this energy weighting case. And again, this comes from quantum field theory. We can inject both this permutation symmetry and this infrared and collinear safety uh, symmetry, if you wanna think about it that way. We can inject that into the machine, get out a solution to that problem that I wanna solve. But if I really wanna think like a physicist, and I want to reproduce the workflow that I do with, you know, my graduate students. You know, I'm not satisfied with my physics graduate students if they just give me a solution to the problem that they've that I've posed. Uh, I want to find some way of verifying that they've actually carried out that analysis in the correct way, and building an architecture that actually has verification built in and the ability to check that the answer is physically sensible. That's one of the things that uh, we want to make sure that we do as part of this institute. Uh, uh, because this is one of the key things that uh, one does in the, in the physical sciences is this verification and uh, quantification of uncertainties. So uh, let me give you the equation that actually describes uh, these energy flow networks. And it's actually quite simple. Uh, when I first entered into this uh, area of machine learning and artificial intelligence, I, I expected things to be very complicated. And while there are many complications associated with neural networks and their training, um, in terms of encoding some of these symmetries, it turns out to be relatively straightforward, at least in this case. So I'm gonna uh, solve my problem acting on jets. I'm gonna solve it in a kind of uh, two-stage process. The first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to look at individual particles. So that's what's represented by this phi function on the, um, on the right-hand side here. This phi function, there are multiple of these phi functions labeled by A, and that phi function takes in information about the directions that the particles are going. It gets multiplied by the energy of those particles, and then I sum over all particles in my uh, in my jet that I want to study. And that sum operation has the permutation invariance that we need, and this linear weighting uh, in energy. This allows us to do uh, deal with this energy flow or deal with this the safety. And remarkably, uh, uh, if I specialize uh, this Carnegie Mellon paper on deep sets and specialize to this case with this linear linear energy weighting, you can actually prove that this functional form. Uh, describes any safe observable. Uh, and it turns out to have excellent jet classification performance, you know, basically state-of-the-art performance uh, with fewer parameters than um, other methods that are in the literature. Now, I've, I've hidden the neural networks that are baked into this phi function. I've also hidden the neural networks that are baked into this f function. What this f function does is it synthesizes uh, all these va functions and synthesizes that into a final solution. Um, and maybe that letter v is suggestive. Uh, that letter v uh, stands for verification. And I can verify uh, that the machine is doing something sensible by looking at this internal representation. Uh, we often call this a latent space. Um, look at this latent space representation of a jet and try to figure out if that latent space representation carries the physical meaning that we want. So for people who are familiar with convolutional neural networks, this is similar to trying to plot a filter activation function. Uh, in this case, I'm actually just directly plotting what this verification function looks like. And you think about this verification function is basically asking the machine, hey, what part of the uh, flow of energy were you focused on? And in the uh, uh, pictures that I'm gonna show momentarily, you're gonna see a representation of what the machine has learned to do uh, for a particular jet classification task and what information it thought was important for solving that problem. And what we're gonna see is that the way that the machine looked at that information is one that has physical meaning. So again, I've already put in physics here. I've already put in the energy flow concept. I've already put in permutation invariance. I've already capitalized on the machine learning advanced on the CS side of this deep sets architecture from CMU. Now I wanna see, has the machine learned additional physical principles uh, uh, in the way that it's approached to solving uh, this jet classification task? And uh, what's really cool is that this visualization, it's uh, kind of psychedelic. Uh, but this is a representation of what the machine learned, and I'll try to walk you through this. So again, what I'm trying to do is a very simple binary classification task. Tell the difference between sprays of particles coming from quarks and sprays of particles coming from gluons. These sprays of particles are going into uh, the screen here, and the center of that spray of particles is uh, at the center of these boxes. And in these boxes, I'm representing where the machine is paying attention. So each one of these rings, you should think about that as being like a uh, filled in blob. And what you can see uh, is that the machine uh, has decided to pay attention to small blobs near the center, near the center of the jet, and larger blobs near the periphery of the jet. Um, and 
uh, the number of these V functions, the number of these verification functions, basically gives you a sense of the resolution that the machine has in order to try to reconstruct this jet. So we start off with a latent dimension of eight, then 16, then 32 and 64, and you're already trying to starting to see that the machine has learned very interesting patterns. Um, these blobs are arranged in a in a uh, uh, in a symmetric way around the uh, central point. That is, if you go around an azimuth uh, around that central point, you see that it's basically paying attention to information in a, in a uniform way going around in the circle. Um, but you also see that it's paying attention to information uh, at the center with with finer resolution than at the periphery. And if I go to the kind of scaled out full uh, you know, most psychedelic image is kind of like the self-similarity fractal structure that you see. And this fractal structure is not an accident. This fractal structure is the known fractal structure of the strong force, um, uh, something that, again, is part of my own domain knowledge. So without me telling the machine that fact by just telling it some baseline facts about quantum field theory, it actually, in some sense, inferred this other fact about quantum field theory that there's this logarithmic scaling of information as you go towards the central uh, part of this uh, of, of the jet. So the machine has figured out the scaling of the strong interactions. Um, and so uh, just to give you some jargon, uh, the scaling uh, is called uh, Altarelli Parisi uh, scaling. Uh, it's our, our DGLAP evolution is another way that it's called. Um, it's been known since the 1970s. It's the kind of things that are in particle physics textbooks. And it's just completely amazing to me uh, that the machine figured this out. So um, the way that you would you would infer this is you'd say, okay, take these blobs, say what's the radial distance from the center of the jet, and what is the size of the kind of blob or pixel that it reconstructed, and you can then find a scaling relation. And if you had exact Altarelli Parisi scaling, then you would get a slope of two. Uh, the fact that you get a slope of 1.6 here is because of, of effects that we actually understand from the particle physics side. Um, and uh, Knowing the scaling, you can actually come up with an even more psychedelic uh, representation of the information. This is basically logarithmic scaling going to the center of the jet. And if I uh, do a, uh, a projection of the psychedelic image into the space where uh, I basically undo that logarithmic scaling, uh, you get this kind of uh, you know, Jackson Pollock-esque <laughs> image here uh, that's showing that the machine has figured out how to pay attention to information in a uniform way but not uniform in the way that a standard convolutional neural network would pay attention to things, uniform in this logarithmic space. And the fact that you see kind of uniform pixels uh, uh, in, this, in this representation here is evidence that the machine has really picked up on a key feature of the physics problem. And now we can take this key feature, bake it back into our machine learning architecture, and then see what we, we can learn next from it. Uh, but this is an example of teaching a machine to think like a physicist, and it responded by actually learning something cool. It learned the fractal structure of the strong force. Now, the fractal structure of the strong force is something that's already known. And in backup slides for people who are interested, I can actually show you something new that it taught us that's uh, even more technical than what I said already. But I hope you, this gives you kind of a flavor of the type of reasoning that we're doing uh, in my research program. And then we want to uh, push out to this institute as a whole of, uh, of incorporating uh, domain knowledge. And then from that, uh, both relearning things that we already know, but in this machine learning lens, uh, but then also using that to discover things that we didn't know about our data sets. And uh, just to, to just put a punctuation mark on, on, on this point, like this collision course is not just this example that I showed you here. Uh, gaining new insights in fundamental physics facilitated by advances in mathematics, statistics, and computer science. In, just in my own research group and with my students, Patrick and Eric, we've seen incredible connections. Uh, so for example, uh, there's a field uh, of machine learning called blind source separation, where you're trying to learn from unlabeled data sets. And uh, leveraging that idea of blind source separation, we actually were able to define in a rigorous way actually something that's a little bit ambiguous, uh, even from the perspective of quantum field theory, namely, how do you define in a rigorous way what a quark or a gluon actually is? It turns out that a half century of collider physics data analysis strategies uh, can be translated into the language of optimal transport. So for people who know what the earth mover's distance is, it turns out that that earth mover's distance is connected in a very interesting way to uh, things that we've been doing for 50 years in collider physics. And then even fields like graph theory turned out to be highly relevant. Uh, and this is an example of the vice versa kicking in, uh, where uh, we actually had a problem in collider physics that we could translate into a graph theory picture and understanding the collider physics actually allowed us to uh, extend an entry in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences about a particular property of graphs 
and actually extend that, again, using information from the physics side to actually just answer a simple question about graph counting. And all these examples that I've been doing with my students, this is just an example of progress being driven by early career talent with cross-disciplinary expertise. You know, Patrick and Eric had a computer science background that they brought into the physics realm, and this is something that we think is, is, is quite powerful, and now they're able to take their physics knowledge and then push it back out uh, into, uh, into, for example, industry applications. And trying to reproduce uh, th th this story that I just told you, in some sense, that's what this NSF Institute is all about. Um, we are uh, 20 physicists and seven AI experts uh, across MIT, Harvard, Northeastern, and Tufts. And part of our excitement about this institute is that the Boston area really had a critical mass for uh, transformative research at the intersection of, of fundamental physics and AI. Um, at MIT in particular, it involves people working on many, many different fields. Uh, and even though we're all at the same institute, uh, we are, uh, as, as is true of many places, you know, in our own silos, uh, this, uh, this institute gives us an opportunity to see the commonalities in our ways of approaching problems. And I, I, I'm really excited to see what happens when you take uh, physicists and AI experts, put them together uh, uh, in a room and, and seeing what uh, types of new solutions come out. Um, we've been calling uh, this internally, uh, this research, we've been calling it ab initio uh, AI research or AI squared. So what do I mean by ab initio artificial intelligence? Well, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning strategies, that's, that's, that's pretty clear, but ab initio uh, means you know, from first principles. And so machine learning that incorporates first principles, best practices, and domain knowledge from fundamental physics, that's what we're calling this ab initio artificial intelligence. And in this uh, example that I gave you already, um, I uh, invoked uh, the notion of symmetries, and I invoked uh, verifiability, uh, and there's many other uh, first principles and best practices from fundamental physics that we hope to incorporate into the machine learning strategies that we develop. And I should also say that you know we're not the only ones thinking in this direction. Um, and even if you just go back to uh, you know let's say convolutional neural networks, one way of stating what convolutional neural networks are able to achieve in a uh, in a symmetry language is achieving uh, what's known as translational equivariance or translational invariance, uh, which in the physics context is associated with conservation of momentum. Um, and baking in that translational symmetry into a CNN, that explains a lot of uh, the power of CNNs in image recognition and image processing applications. In the case of energy flow networks, we took physical principles of the indistinguishability of identical particles from quantum mechanics, this infrared and collinear safety from quantum field theory in generating these cool psychedelic images. And this is just an, an example of AI squared. So AI on the ab initio side, a powerful strategy to analyze collisions at the Large Hadron Collider and try to understand the structure of the universe. AI on the artificial intelligence side, uh, uh, this is a point, an efficient neural network that can deal with weighted point clouds. You take those two together and you have this example of cross-cutting res research uh, that goes across uh, traditional uh, disciplinary boundaries. And uh, I gave you an example from particle physics here just as, as an example, um, but our institute involves people working in a variety of different fields. Um, and what all these fields share in common is that they're extremely data rich. Uh, so for example, gravitational waves, which I'll explain a little bit more uh, about uh, in, in a moment, you know, this is data that's uh, streaming into detectors uh, that are listening into the, the universe, looking for, listening in for uh, ripples in space time that might come from colliding black holes. You have first principles nuclear physics calculations, um, uh, which I'll explain also a little bit more, where you have synthetic data, where you try to put the dynamics of quarks and gluons on a computer and try to infer nuclear properties from that. Uh, we have people in our institute working in astrophysics. I mentioned uh, particle colliders already. Uh, mathematical physics, where um, actually people who work in string theory uh, need to solve problems uh, in uh, knot theory, as an example and trying to find new ways of classifying knots. If you can do that successfully on the mathematical physics side with AI, you can actually do a better job uh, in string theory research. And then dark matter. Dark matter is a mysterious substance that uh, is responsible for a lot of the structure in the universe, even though we haven't seen it directly. And trying to understand the nature of dark matter, uh, we have researchers who are taking AI techniques uh, into that particular domain. So uh, these areas and more are things that we're excited about pursuing in the Boston area, and I'm gonna tell you just a little bit more about that uh, in my remaining time. So um, how are we going to uh, accomplish this? What are our, our, our strategies for actually getting people uh, uh, in the same room to uh, view their data sets through this uh, artificial intelligence lens 
or for people who come from the foundational AI side uh, to see uh, the types of lessons that can be learned from fundamental interactions data. Um, and one of the things that we're doing, which we just launched, is uh, launching a uh, postdoctoral fellowship opportunity where uh, we want to recruit, train a talented and diverse group of early career researchers and spark interdisciplinary, mostly investigator, multi subfield collaborations. And we're looking for uh, postdoctoral fellows who are sitting at the intersection of these various fields. And in particular, uh, people who might be overlooked um, in physics departments or in computer science departments because their work is on the boundary, uh, giving them an opportunity for a postdoctoral experience to really um, uh, establish the viability of research that happens at these intersections. So we actually just had our first uh, application round for, for these iFi fellows. Um, and uh, we are in the process of reading through uh, exciting uh, research proposals. Uh, and uh, it'll be really great to see what these early career researchers do uh, as part of uh, our institute. In terms of the research that we're doing, I mentioned we had these three thrusts. Uh, we have this uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, ab initio artificial intelligence for theoretical physics, for experimental physics, and for foundational AI. And this covers a, a wide variety of fields. And um, we decided that intellectual diversity was really important and that people working in disparate areas but coming together to use common um, uh, strategies and techniques, that's how we decided to organize our institute as, as opposed to focusing on you know, one particular problem. Kind of the big problem that we're trying to do is define what do you mean by ab initio artificial intelligence? What do you mean by teaching a, a machine to think like a physicist? So I'll be giving you just three examples uh, in the next three slides. Um, uh, those are the ones that are color coded here. Um, but just to say we're working on standard model physics, which is related to what I just talked about already in collider physics, string theory, astroparticle physics, as well as uh, techniques to discover uh, uh, in an automated way physical laws uh, just from uh, raw data. Uh, we have uh, people working on particle physics experiments, again, related to what I, what I just talked about uh, in my presentation, uh, gravitational waves, which I'll describe more in a moment, uh, as well as multi-messenger astrophysics. And then on the foundational AI side, this idea of incorporating symmetries and invariance is a very hot topic uh, in, uh, in AI, uh, uh, speeding up control and inference, basically figuring out how can you run uh, some of this uh, AI uh, fast enough to actually be useful at these uh, LHC applications where we need 25 nanosecond uh, uh, cadences. Uh, I'll mention a little bit about physics informed uh, AI architectures. Uh, as well as the theory of neural networks and trying to understand why neural networks generalize as well as they do using uh, uh, concepts from statistical physics to understand uh, the great performance of neural networks in terms of their uh, their generalizability. So let me just uh, spend the next three slides just going through these uh, three examples uh, that are color-coded just to give you just a little bit more flavor of what we're doing. So in the uh, standard model of particle and nuclear physics, uh, here I'm going to give you an example from my colleague Fiala Shanahan of lattice field theory for nuclear and particle physics. So um, uh, I, I gave you kind of a cartoon of the strong force, um, but I want to emphasize the equations governing the strong nuclear force are known precisely, but precision computations using those equations are extremely demanding. And if you just take all the open supercomputing resources in the United States, um, it's around 10%, a little bit more, that's actually devoted to numerical understanding or numerical calculations of the strong nuclear force. And there's, they're incredibly important um, in particle physics and nuclear physics. They're important, for example, for understanding uh, dark matter. Uh, so dark matter is a mysterious substance that might bump into nuclear matter. And understanding the response of nuclear matter is something that you need to do. And you can uh, gain insight into that by doing these numerical calculations. And uh, what my colleague Fiala did is actually collaborate with industry, with uh, Google's DeepMind, uh, to develop custom AI tools, custom generative models uh, based on uh, 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 technique called normalizing flows that is able to achieve a thousand fold acceleration in a kind of a, a toy uh, lattice field theory calculation while preserving symmetries and guaranteeing exactness of the, of the results in the, uh, in the asymptotic limit. And so this is something that's absolutely essential if you want to do precision calculations to actually have guarantees of exactness as well as understanding of your uncertainties. And what's really cool uh, about this research is that even though this is aimed at nuclear and particle physics, the tools that they designed actually are relevant for interdisciplinary applications. And in particular, some of the uh, challenges for robotics, um, where you have joints that have uh, certain um, uh, 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 mappings, where if you go around uh, an angle by, by two pi, you get back to where you start, 
that's re related in, the, in a fun way to some of the symmetries that you're trying to preserve in lattice field theory. Um, and this architecture is in fact relevant for robotics, even though it wasn't certainly designed originally for that application. So that gives you just a little bit of a sense of how a challenge in fundamental physics is, is relevant more broadly. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, ab initio uh, work in uh, experimental uh, physics, uh, in particular gravitational wave interferometry at, uh, at LIGO. Um, and so when two black holes merge in some distant galaxy, uh, their merger generates uh, gravitational waves that uh, ring out and hit detectors. Um, and this detection of gravitational waves was uh, awarded the, the 2017 Nobel Prize. Um, but this is a very challenging problem of uh, on many aspects. So once you collect this uh, data, basically the ringing uh, that you hear from these black hole black hole mergers, uh, you have to reduce noise. And we have people in our institute working on reinforcement learning for noise reduction. You have to compare to theoretical calculations and the theoretical calculations that you'd have to do are uh, extremely computationally demanding. And we hope that some of these techniques might actually speed that up. Um, and then if you want to correlate the gravitational wave signature that you saw in one place and correlate that uh, with what you see elsewhere, for example, uh, with follow-up telescope observation, then you need to do fast inference. Um, and we have uh, people in our institute that are trying to take machine learning and put it on FPGAs uh, in order to make sure that this inference task can be solved as quickly as possible, such that you don't lose out on opportunities to do multi-messenger uh, astrophysics, where you can actually correlate black hole signatures, correlate that with neutrino signatures, correlate that with radio and, and optical and x-ray and so on. Um, and so fast decision-making is something that's relevant uh, in our institute. And then uh, finally, just in terms of foundational AI, uh, a technique that appears in many disciplines, not just physics, is deconvolution. Um, and uh, we have researchers who are working on trying to uh, uh, figure out from uh, noisy data or from incomplete data, how do you do your best uh, uh, inference of what's really going on? And we think that the unique features of physics applications and the power of these physical principles actually offer compelling research opportunities to advance the field of AI research uh, more generally. So for example, one of my colleagues, Demba Ba, uh, works in a more neuroscience-y direction uh, and trying to separate out neuronal uh, signals uh, using a technique that he's developing called sparse coding networks. And it turns out that this is relevant for trying, uh, that the same kind of mathematics behind that is relevant on the more fundamental physics side of trying to image black holes and uh, an experiment called the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, actually multiple experiments that are all trying to image uh, the central black hole uh, at the central part of galaxies, uh, they have to do this deconvolution task where they have incomplete information and they have to somehow reconstruct this beautiful ring uh, that you might've seen in the news corresponding to an, uh, the halo around a black hole uh, and uh, reconstruct that as best as they can given uh, limited information. And we can use and capitalize on physics priors and an, on interpretability of our methods for re improved robustness. And uh, as I already mentioned before, another aspect of foundational AI is leveraging tools from physics to explain the ability of uh, networks to generalize and actually give you uh, robust answers to things like deconvolution, even though at a formal level, deconvolution is an ill-posed problem. So trying to understand why do neural networks work as well for tasks which might otherwise seem ambiguous. So that just gives you a sense of, of what we're trying to do in, in our institute and happy to take more questions about that. Uh, we have many other uh, activities in terms of uh, internal and external research engagement, workforce development, digital learning, outreach, broadening participation, knowledge transfer to industry, as well as shared resources and happy to talk about any of those if people are interested. Um, but just to summarize, uh, uh, let me give you some talking points and then, and then a last slide. So, you know, the talking points uh, that we want people to know about our institute, uh, we think we have a compelling vision for the future of physics and AI research. We think that by fusing this deep learning revolution with the time-tested strategies of deep thinking in physics, that we can gain a deeper understanding of our universe and as well as of the principles underlying machine intelligence. Um, and that we hope that some of these physics ideas will actually go back into this foundational AI domain. Um, our goal is to train the next generation of researchers working at the intersection of physics and AI. And we have programs like this iFi Fellowships. We're also developing interdisciplinary PhD programs that offer unique opportunities for uh, early career researchers to pursue their interests, since there seem to be a growing number of students who really wanna uh, work at this intersection of kind of the physics and, and computer science realms. And then uh, finally, uh, the research that we're doing in iFi 
has natural synergies with of these emerging interdisciplinary uh, computation and data science institutes that are popping up all around, uh, including at places like Georgia Tech. Um, and you know, our view is that machine learning for the physical sciences is is growing dramatically, and now is the time to start thinking about new faculty hires uh, in this area. And one of the things that we hope that IFI can do is generate you know the next generation of talent that could uh, end up being faculty uh, at these kind of interdisciplinary centers. Um, so with that, let me just uh, leave you uh, with the with the with the summary. Uh, so uh, uh, we're trying to advance physics knowledge from the smallest building blocks of nature to the largest structures in the universe and galvanize AI research innovation. I've given you one example from my own research in particle physics and give you some hints of other things that are going on at our institute. Uh, we're excited about building strong multidisciplinary collaborations and advocating for shared solutions that can work across subfields. And uh, we look forward to collaborations and synergies with the broader AI community. And, uh, and uh, looking forward to, to hearing your questions about our institute, questions about uh, uh, my research, and uh, potentially even possible collaborative opportunities uh, in the future. So uh, thanks very much. And uh, again, looking forward to your, your questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Jesse, for that nice talk. Uh, so uh, I don't think you can hear everyone else clapping. So, uh, so here's a question from uh, Xiaoming Hu. Uh, the scientific projects are very compelling. Uh, besides the interdisciplinary postdoc, uh, how does the AI Institute allocate the resources to select, facilitate, or even integrate these projects? Uh, maybe administratively? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And what we decided to do um, for the way that we funded things is that we wanted to have shared resources. So this IFI fellowship is shared. Um, uh, and we have various programs like, uh, like summer schools um, and, and conferences that are shared and seminars that are shared. Um, but that the way that we were going to help uh, uh, this research happen was to make sure that the training was done at a per PI level. Um, and so for each of our, our senior investigators, um, we figured out exactly what they wanted to do and how many uh, students and postdocs they would need to pursue that. And then we went through in a way of trying to make sure that we had good coverage of junior people in those, in those areas. And then we allocated people according to, in some sense, what the research opportunities were in those areas. I think going forward, um, what we're hoping is that we'll be able to have uh, students who actually uh, benefit from a dual mentorship model where uh, a student would have a, a, a mentor on the physics side uh, and a mentor on the AI side at the same time. Um, but because getting a PhD does require having uh, domain knowledge specifically, we decided that the funding would go to the senior investigators for the support of those junior people directly. Um, with the IFI fellowships as kind of the glue uh, uh, putting those all together. And we'll have to revisit that strategy, but that's that's what we uh, tried to do, is to make sure that each of our programs were, were well supported at the individual senior investigator level, and then the overarching umbrella and our activities were the way that we we're gonna do the synthesis. Great, uh, so there's another question from David Sherrill, who asks, uh, integrating AI with domain knowledge is very interesting. You mentioned an example of building in permutational symmetries. Do you have a general strategy or strategies for deciding what kinds of domain information to include and how to go about including it? Good. So uh, uh, this idea of permutation equivariance, um, I should just emphasize, you know, we're not the first people to think about it. And integration symmetries into AI architectures, this is a growing area. Um, and in some sense, you know, that's the low-hanging fruit. And figuring out how to do that, it's very easy from the physics side. Why? Because we have exhaustive categorization of all possible symmetries that we have in all of our problems. Um, uh, you know, uh, I can tell you about the symmetry structures, not only of the standard model of particle physics, but also the symmetry structures of all possible uh, universes consistent with quantum field theory. So identifying those symmetries is not the challenge. Um, and in fact, incorporating those symmetries uh, is not necessarily uh, uh, that challenging um, uh, because of the advances that are happening in foundational AI uh, in that area. Of course, we still need to do it. Uh, and there's many symmetries that I rely on that are not yet in AI architectures, but identifying uh, them, that's not where I see the, uh, the the main challenge. The main challenge here is that I have all these uh, things in gray at the bottom. Symmetries, conservation laws, scaling relations, limiting behaviors, locality, causality, unitarity, gauge invariance, entropy, least action, factorization, unit tests, exactness, systematic uncertainties, reproducibility, verifiability, you know, and, and, and it goes on. Like these are all the things that I do in my research program. These are all the things that I expect, <laughs> you know, my graduate students to learn. And how do you translate these concepts into an architecture? Symmetries, we know how to do, but 
But factorization, um, this is something where you basically say that certain physical processes can be broken into uh, uh, individual units that are synthesized together in a kind of a Markov chain-like way. How do you build an AI architecture that has that in there and that has factorization in the precise way that we mean it, that it's not a standard Markov chain, um, but it's it's one that's you know, tied you know, specifically to, uh, to to my domain? And uh, it's been really instructive for me to work with foundational AI people and say, look, here is the formula that I know is true. How do you build an AI architecture that satisfies that formula? And they say, well, I know how to satisfy that formula. That's no problem. Uh, but you don't have enough computing resources to actually implement it. And so then you say, OK, how do you, in an efficient way, <laughs> implement my equation that obviously can't be the full one, so it only has approximate uh, uh, factorization, uh, sorry, exact factorization, but only approximate information? Uh, how do I do that? And that becomes a dialogue. So essentially, in terms of a strategy, the strategy has been marching through all the things that we do and asking for each one of those things we do, who in our institute might know of the analogy of that in the AI context, and then vice versa. If you have something that's useful in the AI context, what is the analog of that on the physics side? And it seems to be you get physicists and AI experts in the same room, and you just you know give them you know 30 minutes to just chat, and then just new ideas pop up. Um, and uh, that was certainly uh, uh, the case uh, in um, this example in the middle here. Uh, where I talked about a half century of collider physics coming from this field of optimal transport. I knew zero about optimal transport. Then I talked to my AI friends. They tell me, oh, by the way, your data looks like something that uh, I look at. And then I look at their equations and then I realize, wait a second, your equations look a lot like our equations. And then it took us a couple of years to figure out the translation. But then once we did, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of gains. Um, so I didn't really answer the question, uh, but it's it's getting people in the same room and just articulating what those uh, best practices are, and then trying to find that translation. That's been the strategy that's been effective thus far, and we'll see how long, how far that takes us in the future. Great. So uh, maybe I had a final question. So, and I think you're the right person to ask, given that you're a theoretical physicist. And uh, yeah. I mean, so a lot of people talk about this AI being able to discover laws directly mm -hmm. from data. So, mm -hmm. what what do you see as the uh, uh, like? Is that is that uh, in the near horizon, or or it, it's it's a more long term uh, uh, right, right. vision? Right. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. No, excellent. So, um, one of the things that I want to want to emphasize uh, here. Uh, let me just scroll back to the to the slide where I had this. Um, is that uh, uh, oops, not letting me. It's not letting me go. One second. There you go. Um, that the input that we need is a properly specified problem. So when you say, I would like the machine to learn in an automated way, you know, fundamental physics laws, that sounds crazy. And indeed it is crazy, unless you can come up with a properly specified way, a properly specified problem whose answer would be the laws of the universe. So let me give you an example in quantum mechanics. Um, uh, uh, there's this famous black body radiation spectrum, which is a consequence of, co of quantum mechanics. Uh, that basically says, you know, you turn on an oven at a certain temperature and the radiation comes out, has a very particular uh, uh, frequency spectrum. Um, and it comes from quantum mechanics. And if you gave me all the data in the world on the black body spectrum, how would I ever learn the, uh, the laws of quantum mechanics? And I would argue that you can't, that if all you give me is the black body spectrum, there's simply not enough information there that you would need quantum mechanics to explain it. There's many other simpler formulas uh, that would explain the back body spectrum without getting at the kind of intrinsic structure of it. But then you go and you go to chemistry and, you know, atomic orbitals and, and, and binding. Uh, and there uh, you, uh, uh, you know, have various tools for, for understanding those, those chemical properties. And, and those, those tools ultimately trace themselves to quantum mechanics. And so... If I only had chemical data, also I'd have a, a difficult time, uh, you know, inferring the structure of quantum mechanics. And somehow you need both. You need both information about the black body spectrum. You need information about chemistry. Uh, you need uh, 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 information about, for example, superconductor or sorry, semiconductors. Like there's, there's all sorts of different types of data sets that you would need. And then asserting that they all had a common origin in quantum mechanics. That's the thing that you'd want to learn. Learn from many, many example datas and then try to find an underlying kind of principle. If you can turn that problem into a properly specified optimization problem, then you might hope to, to, uh, to 
to, to, to learn those underlying physical principles. And so for the people who are in our institute who are thinking about automated learning of, of physical principles, what they're doing is they're saying, what does it mean to discover a new law? What does success look like? What is the output of the machine that you would say, oh yes, this corresponds to something that might you know, be justifiably called a new physical law? And then trying to say, okay, then how do you turn that into an optimization task such that you can have alternate laws that aren't as good and then the best one is the one that is somehow most simple, uh, explains the most data, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, generalizes in the appropriate way, uh, has, has uh, more symmetry or whatnot to it. Um, and coming up with rigorous definitions of what a physical law is, this is part of the deep thinking. And this fusion of deep learning and deep thinking, first the deep thinking, specify my problem in a rigorous way, and then it comes the deep learning of having specified that problem in the, in the rigorous way, then take these AI tools to actually solve them in uh, ways that are better than what a human could do. Great. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Fascinating. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, we are already over time, so this is a good time to end. And th thank you again, Jesse, for helping us end the uh, semester's uh, last seminar series on a strong note. Uh, so right. see you everyone next semester, and good luck, Jesse, with your institute. Take right. care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.